What is going on YouTube Lamont at large today? We're at the Summit View Cemetery here in Guthrie, Oklahoma. This cemetery sits on about uh, 70 acres or so. Um, says online has about uh, 13,000 graves or so with 18,000 interments, meaning that there's 5,000 people lying in rest here that do not have markers. So you basically already know what I do. We're gonna walk around, show some graves, talk about how some of these people came to be. A very, very interesting story right over there. We're gonna talk about him. Actually, there's several stories that are very interesting over there. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. But to see her was to love her, love but her, and love forever. Kenneth Ray Moore, Private First Class, U.S. Army, Korea, June 20th, 1932 to December 14th, 1957. On that date, he was working construction up in Kansas, which is the next state north of here Oklahoma and something happened there an accident and uh, he was killed uh, on the job site I'm not really sure how the accident happened or what it was but that is where he lost his life Joshua left this world with his family by his side on December 11th of 2019 to join his heavenly father. In our heartache of Josh's passing, he was able to bless numerous other families through his organ donations and it gives some comfort that we might be able to hear his heart once again. Joshua Caleb Myers was born to Kathy and Howard Myers on February 23rd, 1989 in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Josh attended Guthrie Public Schools until moving at the start of his senior year and graduated from Independence High School in Spring Hill, Tennessee in 2007. And after high school, Josh received his degree in auto body and collision repair. Josh moves back to his hometown, Guthrie, Oklahoma, and met his best friend and love of his life. Joshua and Christina Wells were married on June 23, 2012, in this union, two beautiful girls were born, Madeline Renee and Ariana Kay. Josh loves his little girls, and when he would hear the word daddy, he would light any room he was in. To say Josh was a huge OU football fan would be an understatement. Every football game, he was dressed head to toe with his OU colors. One of Josh's greatest memories was the day he was able to take his little brother Dustin to his first OU football game just last year. So on December 7th, 2019, uh, Joshua had went down uh, to a bar in Oklahoma City, which is about 20 miles, give or take, uh, just south of here. And at this bar, I don't know exactly what took place because you never really truly know exactly what happened because, well, I wasn't there and neither were you. But from what best I can kind of see, uh, it looks like a drink was accidentally spilled and one other person uh, by the name of uh, Aaron Michael Waller uh, took exception to this uh, drink being spilled. Now, according to eyewitnesses, uh, Joshua here was not the aggressor in this altercation. And what ensued was uh, some form of a fight or another. And Aaron hits Joshua. He falls on the ground. He's unconscious. 911 is called. 
police come, paramedics come, they take Joshua here to the hospital uh, where he would lie uh, in a coma for the preceding uh, four days. And on December 11, 2019, of course, they probably told uh, his parents that there was no brain activity and they decided to donate his organs uh, in the process of his death. So because of him dying in this very unfortunate uh, incident. Uh, he saved the lives of countless other people. So this Aaron Michael Waller, uh, he was arrested. I'm not exactly sure what the original charge was when he was arrested, but after uh, police did their uh, investigation, I guess they felt it was uh, uh, the charge of manslaughter uh, was in order. And uh, he was, uh, of course, later found guilty of the manslaughter. And he was only sentenced to four years in prison, which shocks me a little bit because Oklahoma normally, in this kind of occurrence, um, they're pretty hard. Oklahoma, uh, definitely one of the last few states that you would ever want to get in trouble in. Now, I don't know. If he only got the four years, I'm guessing he probably didn't have much of a criminal record. Maybe he was very sorry. Maybe he was, maybe he knew somebody in the DA's office. I, I, I really don't know. Um, like I said, to only get four years, I, I, I don't know what the, what the, what the true story uh, was or is. I, I don't know. Uh, there's not a whole lot of information available about this case, but I pretty much just gave you the rundown of what what took place. And uh, he was sentenced to uh, four years in prison, and he started his prison sentence uh, just last year. So I don't know when he's going to be up for parole. So I don't know if he was out on bail during the trial. He probably was. So uh, more than likely, he, he'll probably be getting out, uh, I'm guessing, in the next couple years and uh, you know it's stories like this that it's just you know these these are like the worst the, some of the worst deaths to me it's like the, the totally needless you know and this wasn't a murder legally but depending on who you are it just you know and this is exactly why I don't like going to bars and, and if I do go to a bar with my buddy uh, 11, 12 o'clock, I, I leave because, you know, once one o'clock, one thirty, people start drinking too much and people start thinking they're tough and, and they're bigger and badder than what they really are. And I just I avoid the drama. I just I, I, I check out. Uh, rest in peace to this young man, only 30 years uh, of age. And he, he left behind a couple of kids that won't won't have a dad to raise. And that's very tough to have two girls. I mean, a, a, any children to, to, to raise without a, a dad, very, very tough. My condolences to the family. That's uh, terrible, terrible, terrible. Loretta Long was only 18 years old at the time of her death on May 19th, 1955. But when she was alive, she was a student at Oklahoma A&M, which is now Oklahoma State University. Uh, she graduated here from Guthrie High School. So on May 11th, she was driving in a car uh, with two other people, one of them 19-year-old Charles Faulkner. Now, if I hear a story from the 50s of three people in a car, two girls uh, and, a, and a boy, uh, I'm going to guess the boy was driving. It's just how it was back in those days. I wasn't there neither were you so I don't really know but I would guess he was driving and uh, they got into a really bad car accident it looks like they were about uh, three miles north of Norman Oklahoma which is just a little south of Oklahoma City and uh, they got into a head-on collision with another car and uh, Loretta was thrown from the vehicle and she was taken to a hospital in Norman where she was uh, in a coma uh, for about uh, a week or so and then she tragically lost her life on the date of her stone, May 19th. And uh, they believe it was, you know, because of uh, just a very severe brain injury. Now, the Charles Faulkner, who they believe was driving the vehicle, uh, was arrested and charged with first-degree manslaughter. Now, 
Uh, I don't know why. So he was taken to jail and he was released on a $5,000 bond. He gets out of jail and I don't know what kind of family he comes from, but um, basically the uh, either the prosecutor or the judge, I think the judge in the case, he basically threw it out because he said, well, we don't know who was driving. And there was a third person in the car. I don't know if they refused to talk to police, but that's what, you know, that was uh, the quote in the newspaper. We don't know who was driving. So uh, he was released and uh, he went on to, uh, to live his life. And uh, this girl uh, tragically lost her life. I'm guessing because she got thrown out of the vehicle, she was not wearing a seatbelt. Uh, or maybe it was only one of those lap belt things because back in those days, I don't think the, I think the, all the seatbelts were just lap belts. I don't know when they exactly started making it like the shoulder part of it, but just basically off the top of my head. I, I know older cars have those kinds of, uh, seatbelts. So. This is James Perry Jackson III, and he was working over at the Ambrose and Graves Mill uh, up in Nevada, Missouri, uh, back in August of 1895. He was working along with about four or five other people. Uh, it was a brand new four-story mill. I'm not sure exactly what the mill was producing, but uh, it got struck by lightning during a storm, and him and another man... Uh, were seriously hurt and he ended up losing his life uh, because of that lightning strike. Uh, this grave, uh, it doesn't have his name actually on the marker. And the only reason why I know his name, of course, because he has the plate right there on the other side, it does not have uh, any kind of um, nothing. It's just a blank uh, grave. So I don't know if the family couldn't afford to uh to have his name uh put on the stone or not clara b an infant wife and daughter of jc yarber i can only assume of course that it tells me that uh, she died during childbirth This marker right here doesn't look like it has uh, any markings for the name of the soul who lies here. Yep, just just a, just a marker. That's it. No name. Morenta Nickens Crabtree, the Oklahoma poetess, or is it poetess? Not really sure. Uh, anyways, uh, not much information about her other than what's inscribed on her stone about her being a poet. And of course, at one time or another, uh, she had her picture on her stone and she's buried alongside of her husband who at one time also had a picture on his stone that's why when uh, i see pictures that fell from markers i always glued them back on just keep a uh, a little bit of a uh, gorilla glue with me and sometimes if i can help it i'll you know get the picture i'll, I'll normally i like to carry like a like a couple pieces of lumber and then i'll i'll, I'll glue the the picture on and then I'll just put a piece of wood and I'll just lean it up. And, you know, if, if I happen to be leaving town, well, I'll just leave it there. And then as long as it, you know, has a nice hole to it, uh, it usually, usually takes about uh, one or one or two hours and it's, it, it'll stay. But uh, that's why I need uh, more room in my van so I can carry these materials so I can fix some of these graves. The name Elmer McCurdy may not ring a bell when I say his name, but his story, more than likely, you probably have heard about it because it's been told over 
and over and over and over and over and over again. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to be telling that story again. Uh, so Elmer McCurdy was basically a bungling robber, right? He's one of these guys that when you committed a crime and you kind of seen that you weren't cut for that life, you probably should have stopped and went straight. And unfortunately for this guy, uh, he didn't get the clue that he just wasn't made out for a life of crime. So Elmer was born on January 1st, 1880 uh, up in Maine. Now he already had a rough start to life because this guy was born, well, to an unwed mother and his mother was 17. And in 1880, you did not have a child, number one, out of wedlock. Okay, I guess it was okay for a guy to just, you know, bed you down and then leave town. But if you were the woman and you were stuck with the responsibility of raising the kid, uh, you were looked upon as, well, basically the, uh, you know, W word. And on top of that, she's 17 years old, right? That's something that if that happens, usually like a woman would give the child away or you just kind of like disappear and, you know, go to a new town and then you just make up a lie or change your name, change your identity. Oh, the father died in a, in a horse accident or whatever. So I'm raising him on my own. That's how it normally happened back in those days. So instead of the mother, uh, Sadie uh, McCurdy, you know, doing all that because she didn't really know who the father was. I mean, she did, but, you know, he probably just kind of smashed and passed or whatever. So she goes to her brother, George, and says, uh, hey, listen, <laughs> what are we going to do about this? And the brother, he's like, all right, look, this is this is what we're going to do. Um, we'll like, you know, hint, hint, whatever, adopt him. And then we'll basically we'll raise Elmer like he's uh, mine and Helen's child. So for the first, um, you know, 10 years as this kid's growing up, he thinks that uh, his mother's brother is his real father and that his wife is his real mother. So George later, he gets sick and I think he ended up dying of, I'm not exactly 100% sure what he died of. It might have been TB, don't quote me. Yeah, I think it was TB. So he dies. And then for some unknown reason, Sadie, his mother, and Helen, the woman who raised him as, you know, his mother, they told him the truth. They said, listen, you know, this woman that we told you that was really, you know, you, you know your aunt, Aunt Sadie, really your mom. <laughs> so... When you're 10, 11 years old and you're a kid and you're told that, that's going to screw you up. And that's exactly what happened to him. So from then on out, he became kind of this, you know, uh, rebellious teen. He uh, starts uh, picking up the bottle. He starts boozing it up. This guy basically, for his teenage years, he becomes the town drunk over in uh, Bangor, Maine, right? Because I think that's where the family uh, eventually settled down. So later on, as he's becoming, uh, getting older in his teenage years, uh, they uh, go send him uh, to his grandfather or some somebody they call his grandfather or whatever. So this guy's a plumber. So he sets Elmer down and he says, listen, um, we're going to do, um, we're going to change your life because uh, you're constantly drunk. You're a raging alcoholic. You're a young kid. And I'm going to teach you the very, very valuable uh, skill of plumbing by the way guys uh, uh, just a quick footnote if any of you are ever trying to get your kids to do something with their lives and you're feeling like wanting to send them to a four-year university to get a seventy thousand dollar loan for a line of work that they're never going to do tell them to become plumbers i swear to god if anybody becomes a plumber and you work hard and long enough you're going to be making more money than 90 percent of people that graduate from four-year universities just, just, just saying, just saying. Anyway, so this guy becomes a plumber, apprentice, right? A plumbing apprentice and he's doing okay. He's still drinking, but he, he's doing okay. So as he gets older, his mother passes away from a ruptured ulcer or something along those lines, or appendix maybe. So 
he eventually he makes his way out west and he would end up settling down somewhere in Kansas. Hi, it's me again. So this guy ends up settling down in a town called Cherryvale, right? And he's a now a, a, a straight plumber. By the way, is anybody interested in how plumbing was done back in those days? Uh, I, I, I keep telling Mobile Instinct, let's do a video about the sewer system in, in New York or wherever and just do like an in-depth video about it. I want to do it. I don't know about you guys. I, I, I find that stuff absolutely fascinating. So he becomes, uh, so he's working as a plumber in Cherryville, Kansas. This guy's still drinking. He still has a drinking problem, but he's living his life. He's living his best life as a kid say, you know. Now he gets arrested for a public intoxication, right? Not a big deal. Probably a $5 fine, maybe a night in jail. You sleep it off, whatever. Okay. He gets out of jail. He's doing this thing. Uh, later on, this guy wants to change his life. You know what I mean? He, he maybe, you know, listen. He's had a bad upbringing, not terrible bad, but that whole thing with the mother and the, the mother, you know, your aunt really being your mother. And then the woman you thought was your mother wasn't your mother. And then the guy that you thought was your dad is dead. That can weigh on you. So maybe he says, I need some purpose. I need some purpose. He joins the United States Army. Maybe that'll clean him up. Maybe it will. So he joins the Army and... He gets a job or they give him the job as a machine gunner, right? So he's a machine gunner and we're not at war at that time. And he's uh, based uh, out in uh, at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And they also introduce him to this thing called nitroglycerin. Um, nitroglycerin is uh, like this oily liquid, right? And they, they make into a... You know, a powder and basically it's the main ingredient I believe it's the main ingredient ingredient in uh, dynamite and it's also used as a, a propellant and to blow things up so he has a rudimentary understanding of nitroglycerin and how it works and that will will stay with him right he does three years in the army he gets out, he gets an honorable discharge. Now, this guy just got out of, the, out of the army. He has an honorable discharge. He doesn't have much of a criminal record. So what would you do? Like you get out of the army and man, this guy, that nitroglycerin is really, he got like nitroglycerin on the brain cause he can't stop thinking about that stuff. And he's like, you know, he he's, meets up with his friend. He's like, you know, this nitroglycerin, like we can use it to blow up things you know like blow up safes and vaults and things that contain lots of money and gold and silver or whatever whatever you want to do so one night him and his friend they got this plan where they're going to blow up or, br or break into this um like a store because they're doing like they're planning on doing these small time robberies because because why do you want to work for a living when you could just steal from others so just after he gets out of the out of the uh, army, right at around the end of 1910, he's walking with his friend. It's at night, maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night. And the police kind of, or not the police, but the sheriff's deputies, they roll up to him. What are you doing? What are you doing out here at 11 o'clock at night carrying a bunch of uh, 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 weird uh, items? Uh, they're looking into their bags and what they have. They got like hacksaws, chisels. Hammers, ropes. Why are you carrying these tools at night? So they arrest him and charge him with possessing, uh, I guess what would be now possessing burglary tools. They believe that these guys were up to no good. So they would sit in jail for uh, maybe four to six weeks, something. And they took it all the way to a jury trial. And their defense was that we weren't going to break into anything. We were just going to use <laughs> these tools because we're working on a brand new prototype machine gun that's operated via a foot pedal oh okay so the jury buys it and they're found not guilty now they get out of jail now by this time you don't have a criminal record other than the public 
intoxication arrest, right? You can still turn your life around. You're still a young guy. What is he now? Uh, 30? You can turn it around. You're a plumber for God's sake. And God knows people need plumbers. But this is Elmer McCurdy we're talking about here. We're going to fast forward a little bit to March of 1911, right? So now at this time, Elmer McCurdy, he has a couple of guys with him, a couple of you know losers, you know, loser bandits, loser people wanting to steal stuff like that. Now, at this time in, in American history, robbing trains isn't really a thing anymore. I mean, it's out of fashion. Later in a future video, I'm going to get more into detail about train robberies, who these people were, why they were doing it, so forth and so on, how they were doing it. But the, the heyday of robbing trains really was in the 1870s to the 1890s, right? Um, however, which way you would do to stop a train, whether you built a big bonfire on the tracks, whatever you were trying to do, sometimes guys would even just stand on the train track and point a gun at the, at the conductor and make him stop the train, or you're going to shoot him, or they would just derail the train. They would, de they would vandalize the train track, whatever it is that they would do. So they start thinking about like, listen, I know about nitroglycerin because I was in the army and we can rob some trains. I could blow the saves up and we can, you know, loot them. Now, because of all the train robberies that occurred, you know, 20, 30 years previous, you know, by the, by the, you know, the Dalton gang and, and all those, uh, the Jesse James, uh, all those guys, Doolins and whatever. So these trains that are moving like shipments of gold, they got these safes that are like very, very, well, as they would call them indestructible, right? So the only way you would be able to get into those saves is to blow them up, right? So they tried to rob this one train that was coming through. It was the Iron Mountain, Missouri Pacific train. So they got tipped off that there was a lot of money in the safe, about four grand, right? So they, they stopped the train, they get aboard, pull out their guns, and uh, Elmer goes to blow up the, the safe, right? He uses his, you know, the nitroglycerin uh, powdered or whatever form, you know, whatever. So he blows the safe up, but he uses too much nitro, right? So the blast was so intense that it actually melted most of the coins to the actual frame of the safe itself. So <laughs> they, I think they were only able to make off with some uh, silver, uh, $450 worth of silver coins. So the, the rest they couldn't move because they basically welded itself, right? So after that, they left and they would try their hand again at another robbery. So in Chattaqua, Kansas, by the way, let me know if I mispronounced that, uh, that name, uh, Chattaqua, Kansas, uh, they would try to rob a bank at night by you know, they, they would blow off the door of the vault using his nitroglycerin. And then they would get into the safe, blow that up, and then rob it. Now, they did get the, the, the vault uh, door off. Uh, however, they weren't able to open the safe because, it, for some unknown reason, it, it, it didn't blow up. So they were only able to make out with about $150 in coins. So now by this time, you have basically have committed two failed robberies, right? And maybe you shouldn't be doing this. But we're talking about Elmer McCurdy here, right? So on October 4th, 1911, they tried to rob another, another train. Uh, however, this time they weren't able to get into the safe. They bungled that up. So they ended up robbing the passengers for about 50 bucks. They took the conductor's watch. They took a revolver off of the train and uh, they stole some whiskey. The local newspaper that reported this robbery called it, quote, one of the smallest train robberies in history, right? Now, by this time, uh, this guy is absolutely sick, right? Um, you know, by the way, that train that they robbed, uh, I guess, uh, there was some huge shipment of money. There was supposed to, supposed to be $400,000 because it was supposed to be some kind of a payment. 
uh, that they were supposed to pay to some uh, Indian tribe in uh, what was now Oklahoma. It used to be called Indian Territory, I believe, at that time. I don't think they were a state at that time. And they couldn't get into that safe. I mean, do you think you're going to put $400,000 in that day's money, which would be several million now? Do you think you're going to put it into some safes where some goobers, some goofs could just blow it open? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely crazy. So by this time now, he's getting... He's getting very popular with the local sheriffs. Um, and there's a reward, there's a bounty on his head, right? They want Elmer McCurdy. And things are not looking good for Elmer. Number one, he has a bounty on his head, right? Uh, may maybe $2,000 reward, don't quote me. I think it was $2,000. But also, Elmer McCurdy is sick. He has tuberculosis, he has trichinosis, which is basically a, a, a worm parasite in your intestine that makes you have vomiting, you know, diarrhea, uh, abdominal pain, all that, all the good stuff that you don't want no part of. And he has pneumonia. So this guy's very, very, very sick and he's on the run. So on October 7th, a uh, sheriff's posse, they get word that uh, he's hiding out in some barn somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Probably looks like something like this, right? This would look like a place where you would just kind of hide out if you been robbing places and you got diarrhea so this guy has diarrhea he had he's vomiting and he's drunk right because he's an alcoholic so they tracked him down to this barn and they know he's in there so they yell elmer mccurdy we know you're in there come out with your hands up and well he doesn't do it but he does something else he takes a shot at them <laughs> okay so now for the next hour or so there's a kind of a shootout, right? Right. And so after a while, there's no more gunshots. Okay, now we don't know. I mean, let's say that was the barn. Sorry to the person who owns that house, but I'm gonna use your your house as the barn. Lovely house, by the way. Now, there's no more gunshots, but we don't know. If he's just like reloading, we don't know if we hit him. We don't know anything. So I think they waited quite some time and they eventually went in and they found old Elmer McCurdy dead. He had got shot by one of the three guys. Not sure where he got, but one of the three guys shot him and he got shot somewhere in his, in his, in his chest. Excuse me. Oh man, this story is dragging. I'm sorry, guys. I am sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry if I'm babbling on and on about this story, but it's a pretty interesting story. So you're not going to hurt my feelings if you feel the need to fast forward. But, uh, well, you kind of would. I'd be a little bit sad, but what are you going to do? So after they kill him, they take his body to, is it Pawuska, Paush, Paushka, Oklahoma, right? So they take him to the local undertaker of this place named Joseph Johnson. And they drop his body off and... He embalms him, uh, and instead of using the normal the normal embalming process that they would use, he used like basically arsenic, which would make a body last way longer than in the normal um, chemicals that they used. So he embalms him, and he's I guess he's waiting for somebody to claim his body. Nobody comes, and this guy, he's just like, all right, I want to be paid, right? So. He has a great idea. He's like, well, since I didn't get paid for my services, uh, he's go he, he decides to take Elmer's body, dress him up, put a, put a rifle in his hand, and he would charge people five cents to see his body, which like, I guess today would be like a, like a dollar. And so he put a sign that said, uh, you know, see the, see the bandit that uh, wouldn't be taken alive or something like that. So people would, would, would pay to, to, to see his body. So this went on, I want to say, for a few years. And then in, uh, in 1916, uh, uh, his brother, Elmer's brothers, heard about this travesty that they were doing to the, uh, their, their deceased brother's body, that they're putting him out uh, for people to look at. And his brothers, they're like, this is disgusting. So they come out from San Francisco all the way out here to Oklahoma 
And then they, they, they contact the deputy and they said, that's our brother. That's our brother. How dare you display his body like that? This is disgusting. This is absolutely disgusting. And they, I guess maybe they get a court order and they go to, to the undertaker's place and they say, this is our court order. Give us our brother's body back. So he gives them the, the body back. Well, those guys weren't really Elmer's brothers. Uh, they were James and Charles Patterson. Uh, they owned a, an amusement company called, I think, the Patterson's Greatest Show on Earth or something. I don't know. So they, they steal the body, and then they just use the body to display it uh, in, their, in their show. They're traveling circus, side show, freak show, or whatever. So for the next... Uh, Five or six years, uh, Elmer is on display, and then they put a sign that says, uh, "You know, uh, meet uh, the man that would never be captured alive," and uh, all this and that. So uh, now Elmer's body is on display at this uh, traveling, traveling place. So in 1922, the brothers they sell out their business or their sideshow items, something like that to a man named Louis Sonny. So Louis Sonny had a, a, a traveling crime museum, right? So he buys uh, Elmer McCurdy's corpse and displays it with his traveling crime museum sideshow thing, right? So he has this for a while and eventually, I guess he would either go out of business or maybe he would get older and kind of retire. So the body would end up being put in storage, right? So it's put in storage for a while. Now, I'm going to just basically summarize the story as quickly as I can now because I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel like I'm dragging this out a little bit longer than, than should be. So this Elmer's body is put in storage and it's it, it gets sold from different people, different people, different people. And it, it, it actually ends up uh, as a prop for some kind of fun house at a pier in Long Beach, California. So now we're at, we're in uh, we're we're in December of 1976. So by this time now, nobody knows that this that this is a real corpse. By this time now, it it almost looks like a wooden mummy. And so, in an episode of the Six Million Dollar Man, they need a filming location of I don't know a, a fun house or whatever. So the, the producers, they get this place, this fun house, to film the scene for whatever part episode of the Six Million Dollar Man they're gonna do. So one of the production assistants, he, he sees you know, the, 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 the wax figurine and he handles it, he takes it, and he uh, is carrying it or something like that, and then he accidentally bumps it and the arm comes off. Now, this guy thinks it's a wax figure of, uh, you know, like maybe it's a wax museum thing, but he notices that there's a human bone and like muscle tissue. This is not a wax mummy. mummy. This is a real corpse. So immediately he tells his boss and they call the police. The police come uh, and they, they, they get the mummy and they take it to the Los Angeles County coroner's office. So the coroner does an autopsy on the body. And of course, yes, they confirm it is actually a human body. And they were able to, to tell when the person died based on the embalming process of them using ar arsenic because they used to use arsenic way back in the day. And also they were able to tell that the body, you know, died via a gunshot wound. And they were also able to tell that the body had suffered from tuberculosis and they were able to see the scars of, uh, you know, whatever scars he got from working as a plumber or whatever, or maybe, uh, you know, maybe getting other jobs, what have you. So based on that, and also they were able to, when they opened this mouth, they seen a penny from 1924 and they seen a ticket to, you know, Lewis Sonny's crime uh, museum. So with that and the bullet jacket that they produced, they were able to superimpose the face of the corpse to this here of Elmer McCurdy. 
So this is his grave right here. This is Elmer McCurdy. This is the man who, who is, whose corpse went from place to place to place to place. And eventually, after he was identified, um, they buried him here over in the cemetery on April 22nd, 1977. And about 300 people uh, came to visit his final resting place. I hope I didn't bore you guys to tears. It's just an interesting story about this guy. Uh, and uh, I probably could have made it his own video, but then I have to go to Long Beach, California. And I was like, I don't know, facing the dead kid, right? But anyways, you know, listen, this kid had a, uh, this guy, he had a, a really bad upbringing and just, I don't know, who knows if maybe his mother and father would have got married. Do you think he would have turned out this way? Who knows? Who absolutely knows? But anyways, rest in peace to Elmer McCurdy. Shot by Sheriff's Posse in Osage Hills on October 7th, 1911, it says right there. Someone got a boot, some booze. Moving along, guess guess who he's buried next to? I'm sure you guys already know this. I, I You know, when I do these videos, I, I already feel like you guys have already like know all this stuff that I'm talking about. Well, we got we got William Bill Doolin in the building. So this is an example of of you know I could have included him in this video, but I'm thinking about doing his own video. Maybe we'll see. So we'll we'll talk about. We'll talk about uh, his story in the future. Bill Doolin, one of the most uh, famous outlaws there ever was. Uh, let me show you really quickly. So there's a, so this is like, this section of the cemetery is called Boot Hill, of course. This is where like some outlaws that were killed are buried. And so check this out. There's a couple guys, couple outlaws here, right? that I was going to include in the video. Uh, however, I might, I might save them for like uh, future I plans ideas, but check this out. I want to talk about this guy. I'm not going to talk about his story in depth. I'm just going to show his grave really quickly. This is Burt Casey. And as you can see right here, all it says is killed by, uh, uh killed November 8th, 1902 by us marshals. Um, Actually, I believe the death date is wrong. I believe it was the second. Don't quote me. I, I, I believe it's he was actually killed the week previous. I'm not going to get into his story because... So I, I was... Check this out. Kind of segueing away from that story really quickly. So the reason why I'm not including the grave of Burt Casey in more detail in this story is because there's not a whole lot of information readily available to me about this guy. And what's so funny and strange about Burt Casey is that from the 30 minutes or so that I looked him up online, uh, this guy appears to me to be as crazy, if not more crazy, than Billy the Kid. So I might want to just do a more in-depth video about Burt Casey in a future video or at least include him in possibly a future uh, dark side of where I start doing uh, different cities and counties and what have you. Um, I, I don't know for the life of me, call this a rant if you will, I don't know for the life of me what makes a historical figure more famous, more well known, more infamous uh, than another. I always found the, the Billy the Kid story, I was always questioning myself or just questioning out loud why it was so popular. Because, I mean, Billy the Kid, just like any other pe you know person out there in those, you know, in the wild, wild west, was just a, a, a stone cold thug killer. And I really didn't believe that his uh, story was wor worthy of all of the uh, stories and books and, and, and movies and, and everything. Uh, that has been written about his his life. I actually found this story of Brushy Bill Roberts way more interesting uh, than Billy the Kids. I, I, I found it incredibly interesting <laughs> that this man 
uh, Brushy Bill Roberts uh, was just like, oh, hey, I'm Billy the Kid. I escaped. <laughs> and that was a story that I had, that I seen on Unsolved Mysteries when I was a kid. And that story to me is absolutely five times more fascinating than, than the Billy the Kid uh, story. You know, it's so funny. Um, uh, I was told by someone uh, that uh, a certain YouTuber uh, uh, basically said that my video about uh, when I went to the uh, grave of brushy Bill Roberts that I was absolutely wrong and I had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, well, I would say to this dork is uh, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I do know what I'm talking about when I say this. I got to 500,000 by not cheating, but you did. You cheated. And hey, listen, like I said, said it before and I'll say it again. It feels better when you get to that number of subscribers on your channel and you didn't buy 300,000 subscribers to get to that number. Some people are just very threatened by somebody else's success. It's totally amazing. It's absolutely amazing how if somebody is doing something good or something that they like doing and they enjoy on YouTube and then you'll get somebody who just can't stand it to the point where they're going to pull out their credit card and just buy buy 300,000 subscribers. It's actually quite sad and quite pathetic, but um, you know, you want to be the big man on campus, then you're going to have to learn how to take some body shots. More to come about that story. I think maybe in a future video, uh, I'll do something on Billy the Kid. I'm not terribly interested. Some videos I want to do, but I don't want to do them by myself. Sometimes I want to collab with other people. But I don't collab with cheaters. This kid right here died of congestive heart failure. He was only 15. He was just two weeks shy of turning 16 years of age. Uh, he died down in Austin, Texas. And uh, he's buried on the other side of this marker right here. His dad. Now, he died of uh, a uh, basically a uh, coronary thrombosis which is a blood clot. And this guy was pretty young as well. Looks like he was about 40 years of age. So I don't know if uh, just, uh, you know, the, a bad heart runs in the family or what have you, but. We have a father and son buried together. They both died only about three weeks apart and they both died very young. Uh, this is Del Wittich right here. You can see the medal right here. It says Carnegie Medal Awardee Hero Fund Commission. So Del was working up in Hollywood, Kansas, about 240 miles north of here. Uh, he worked for an oil company uh, called Site Services, and on August 16th, 1973, uh, he was working, repairing a, uh, a an oil tank uh, with about uh, three or four other men. One of the men went down into the tank uh, to do something or another. I don't work in the uh, gas slash oil industry, but I do know that uh, those tanks, and I've heard and read lots of stories of people dying in those tanks because when you go in there, there's a bunch of hydrogen sulfide fumes still in the tank. And when you go in the tank, you're supposed to wear a mask to protect yourself. And for some unknown reason, the man that went down into the tank, he went against company policy without a mask and he quickly was rendered unconscious and Dale and a couple of other guys jumped into the tank without their masks to try to save that guy because if they were going to go get their masks, he would have been dead by the time uh, they would have got into that tank. So this, this kid right here, he gave his life trying to save another man. And uh, he, you know, maybe he tried to hold his breath to go down into the tank, but I mean... 
if you do that, it's almost, almost, not all the time, but it's a, it's a sure death sentence in most cases. And four men going to that tank uh, lost their lives, uh, along with Dale, uh, was uh, Delbert Hendrick, 61 years of age, uh, Harold Holmes, 54, and Jim Thatch, 48. A fifth man was able to escape before he died. And, uh, you know, I, I commend this kid. Not many people knowing the risk of of, of risking their lives would do that. And his father, uh, Robert, right here, uh, he died about, looks like three weeks right after his son died. I don't know how he died. Um, if I do find out, I'll put it on the, on the uh, screen. But this lady, this poor lady right here buried both of her, geez, her son and her husband all in, 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 the, in the matter of less than a month. Kenneth Ray Hinkle is buried right here next to his mother, Melvina. Uh, and Alfred is Melvina's second husband. Uh, looks like they died about two weeks apart. And Kenneth's dad is right here. Check out that old picture. Sergeant Michael Gamble was in the United States Air Force and he was stationed in Japan for about three years. Later on, he came back to the United States and this article that you see right here was printed in the newspaper out here in Guthrie, Oklahoma, where he married his wife. And that article is from the first week of July, 1958. Now, after they got married, he was basically waiting for orders from his uh, superiors about him going out to uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, and he was set to be stationed out there and he was basically, you know, husband and wife just got married. They're waiting for their uh, orders. And uh, they ended up going out to Scotland. And about two and a half months later, uh, Michael here died in a car accident. Okay, guys, I am out of here. I actually wanted to make a longer video. But while it's daylight, I'm going to start heading back to Texas. I got uh, some stuff to take care of, things to plan out, and videos to edit. I'm very, very behind, of course, because of me. My own fault. Live, but not live. Still alive by the grace of God. Lamont at large. Summit View Cemetery. I'll be back here again and uh, we will do it all over once again. Catch up with you on the next video. Be good. Peace out.